your minor league career was incredibly impressive, which is why you made, reached the majors so quickly. And then you got to the majors, and things didn't work quite as well. And I think you know I've read some things that you've you've said. Um, and we did a little interview last year, but I'm wondering how much of it was your physical ability, and how much how much of it was the mental aspect of reaching the majors. Uh, it's it started mostly with the physical, um, which then feeds into the mental. Um, I was not as physically good as I thought I was in the minor leagues. Um, that, that gap narrowed. The things I was able to do in the minor leagues, I was not able to do in the big leagues anymore. And that just in turn um, kind of killed me mentally. And then I just, it, it was a long cycle to, to build myself out of that. Well, I if I could stop you first, do you, do you believe there's such a thing as a 4A pitcher? No. Um, I guess it would be in how you define it. I, the same with hitters, same with pitchers. It's 4A is mentally unable to do it at one level. I, I think that's just what it boils down to. Um, you can't be that good in AAA as a hitter or as a pitcher and not that good in the big leagues. The gap is, the gap is large. It's not that large. Um, and I, I found that most of the people I know that kind of fall into that middle ground, um, there's something there mentally that just they can't quite overcome. And I think sometimes you see people do it and they get there. Nelson Cruz is a great example. You, you, for years, you saw that he was Babe Ruth in AAA in the big leagues. Um, he wasn't serviceable. And then all of a sudden, it just clicked. And it went. And I know that he finally found himself mentally. He was able to relax and do everything he needs to do. And I think that's how you make that 4A jump. Um, it, it is just being able to get over that mental hoop. Now, when you reached the majors in 2005 and struggled a little bit, especially with the home runs, um, were you 100% were you physically at that point? Yeah, until 2007, I never had any sort of a physical issue um, at any level ever. So in 05 and 06, it was really just a matter of not trusting your stuff enough? Was it, I mean, can you go into a little bit of detail on what the issue was mentally for you? 2005 was, at the beginning, it was, it was the first time I had failed um, in years, at least going back through until maybe my junior year of high school where I had had any extended run of not being successful. Um, I, I didn't quite know how to deal with that. The end of that season, I was able to get it back, and I felt like I was back to where I needed to be and throwing well. 2006 um, was a personal loss for me because I was in the bullpen, and I didn't, um, I didn't adjust to that well. I, I had, I'm extremely routine-oriented. Um, everything is kind of planned out to the minute, and I lost that in the bullpen. It's just there's too much chaos um, being a reliever for me to deal with. I, I can't sit there and eat candy and, and goof off and try and burn things in the burner for three innings and then try and get Torrey Hunter out with bases loaded. It just didn't make sense to me. So it, there were days where I was very comfortable, days where it didn't make any sense. So the whole year kind of became lost. And that's where I lost um, my mental confidence in that year, or at least lost my sense of routine and lost kind of um, the pitcher I had become. And in 2007, you suffered a shoulder injury for the first time? Was yeah. That the midway, that was uh, the shoulder? That was, uh, that was a shoulder in, uh -huh. in 2000, yeah, in about May, I think. In, in 2007? Mm-hmm. And what did that do for your confidence? Um, it, that was weird. It was the first time I'd ever been hurt, so I didn't know how to deal with any of that. And I had actually started to throw really well going into that, um, kind of getting myself back to where I wanted to be, and then missing two and a half months or whatever it was. Uh, I, I just I didn't get lost again, but it was just sort of a, what the hell am I doing? I don't know how to, to come back from an injury. I don't know how rehab works. I don't know how to rediscover myself and do it. Um, unfortunately, I've become really good at that process, but. In 2007, I didn't, I didn't understand that. Now, at what point did you stumble across uh, FireJoeMorgan.com? I want to say the first time I really read it was 2008. Um, in spring training, I came up with like, um, a strained forearm muscle. And um, me and my wife now were living in a house in Arizona, just rehabbing and going through that horrible routine of rehab. Um, and I just kind of got um, sort of I'm addicted to information. I have to constantly be reading stuff on the internet about anything and everything. And somehow, I don't remember where I saw a link to it, and I just was hooked. I, it was the funniest thing I'd ever read. Um, and just, it, even though I was unfamiliar with most of the things they were talking about, um, I was able, that was kind of my beginning launch off point. I was able to research the things that they were talking about, see why the things they were saying made sense, why everybody else was wrong and they were right. Um, and I was just hooked from that point on. It's, it's interesting because most people, I mean, Fire Joe Morgan, for those who, who weren't there when it was still around, was basically a humor site in a sense. But they did reference sabermetrics to some degree, and I, I think it's interesting that you found that as a gateway to the, to the other stuff. And then where did you go after that? Um, that then it was just kind of, I think, uh, random. It wasn't like I dove into it um, headfirst. Um, 
really the beginning of fan graphs is when I really started to get into it when you could just see it all in one um, one easy easily accessible place um, more writing I mean some of your stuff anybody that really kind of had stuff out there that was against the mainstream I just started to kind of find and, and scout out myself and well that's my next it. question is what did you see on say fan graphs that was actually relevant to what you were trying to do at, at that initial stage when you really didn't know what you were wanted to, wanting to do uh, it I it had nothing to do with me at that point. That was just solely, I liked looking at it so I could argue about baseball. Mm -hmm. um, it was just purely for argumentative and then understanding what I'm watching right. purposes. Uh, it wasn't for another year or two that I actually tried to apply it um, to myself. Um, I just, I liked what F Fire Joe Morgan did. And so I just wanted to do that mm -hmm. and, and yell at people about stuff that they were wrong. And um, that's how I got it up. So when you eventually ultimately did find something that was useful for you, what, what, what was it? Um, I mean, I had known for years I had given up too many home runs. So right. it was, it's kind of it's hard to miss that. Right? Yeah, that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't an advanced principle. I mean, there were, you'd be as old school as you want. You can come up with you can go up too many home runs. Um, so I, uh, I knew that that was something I needed to, to have lower. And I also knew I just never got ground balls. You'd watch other people throw, and I just constantly, it was all fly balls for me. And had um, that been the case in the minors as well? Were you always a fly ball <coughs> Always have been, yeah. Um, so as I started to kind of make that, that realization, it, it just, it was getting too hard for me. Even to have an okay game, I was working much too hard. Yeah, much too hard. Everything I was doing was just kind of, was tougher than it should be. Um, and I, then I watched guys who got ground balls all the time and just kind of worked inside the strike zone. And it always looked easy and they didn't ever seem as tired. Um, and then Roy Holiday was a big part of that. I would just watch him and it just looked easy, easy, easy. Um, and I just kind of got hooked on that idea. So I just, um, the more I looked at the stats, I realized that ground balls are good. Um, not walking people is good. And then as, hopefully as an offshoot of that, you give a plus home run. So do you still look at, at uh, data and sabermetric stuff? I mean, is that, I mean, there are a lot of different categories we could talk about, but um, do you look at pitch FX data, for example? Is that something that you use regularly? Pitch FX is probably the most, um, yeah, the thing that I use the most, at least in this realm, um, outside of using video. I like having, one, the confirmation of, okay, that pitch did that. I like to see how much my sinker's moving, um, what the cutter's doing, what does my breaking ball look like. Um, anytime I try and venture back into throwing a changeup, I like to see how bad it was <laughs> using that. Um, so it, it, it's just kind of a confirmation for me, but uh, I can also make game-to-game -game adjustments that sometimes the sinker is running too much or isn't actually enough sink on it. Um, and then I know what the correction is for that, and I can do that. Um, sometimes games just happen so fast, and video can lie to you. Um, that pitch FX is kind of the one thing that's just truthful to me. Like you can you can think you're doing something, and it just tells you right there, and you didn't do that, or you did do that. You say you've dropped your arm. Is your fi are your fingers still behind the ball, both on the cutter, just like Greg Maddox did, and you're just changing finger pressure primarily? Yeah, I mean that's um, the two grips are are very similar, at least the way I position my hand. It's just on a different spot on the ball. It's just one pitch, um, the pressure is through my index finger. The other pitch is the pressure is through my middle finger and more the pad in my middle finger. Um, and then it just becomes a feel thing. After a while, eventually, there's some pitches on the, on the cutter for a while, I would get around the side of it, um, but it wasn't too big an issue. And I think anytime you see someone doing that where they're getting around it, um, there's probably an actual injury that they're dealing with. Um, most pitchers know, e even when you go sidearm, you know how to stay behind a baseball and throw it. So the, the getting around the ball or um, drooping around, I think, becomes sort of a, uh, an excuse for probably some sort of an existing injury. At least that's what I've always noticed from guys that start dropping. It's because they're already hurt and they're looking for a place that doesn't hurt. That's almost primarily against, I'm better at it against right-handers than I am are against left-handers and I am right-handers. I have no idea why, but there's just a spot up and away to left-handers where I feel like I can just run a cutter into all day long. So you're back to one into a ball? Um, it is a ball up. Um, I like to work it as a strike backdoor a lot, um, especially behind in the count. But um, for the elevated one, yeah, it's a ball up out of the strike zone. Brandon, for coming tonight.